Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Nine South South Forum on Sustainability. The theme is the collapse of modern civilization and the future of humanity. My name is Sitchoi Jadi Margaret, a founding member of Global University for Sustainability. Today, we have great pleasure to invite Pro Summer uh, Al Bruhushi and uh, Professor Brittany Mache to talk about militarization and the suppression of popular movements in Africa. The lecture is also part of the course on African people's struggles for liberation, which has started from uh, 8th of March in 2022. The course is co-organized by Global University for Sustainability, uh, Lingnan University, Daladra Press, Asian Regional Exchange for New Alternatives, and Green Gua Echo Tech Center. We provide English, French, and Chinese simultaneous interpretation. You can find a group of interpretation at the bottom of your computer screen. We would like to thank today's interpreters, Marie de Prasier and Umit Hussain, uh, Huang Xiaomei and Li Monghong. Apart from Zoom webinar, we are also doing live streaming at Bilibili, which is a very popular social media platform in China. There are thousands of young followers who are interested in world politics and eager to learn from alternative thoughts and experience. Let me first introduce the co-moderator, Dr. Filos Manji. Uh, Dr. Filos Manji is the course director of African Lecture Series. He is a young professor in the Institute of African Studies at Carleton University in Canada. He is also the director of Daraja Press, a publisher that nurtures reflection, shelters hope, and inspires audacity. Now I pass the floor to Filos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jade, uh, for that introduction. Um, as always, just you know, warm thanks and appreciation to um, the Global University for Sustainability, the Lingnan University, uh, Asian Regional Exchange, New Alternatives, and so on. Um, you have all been just extraordinary in the in the way that you have uh, organized not only this but concurrently uh, uh, other other courses. It's it's really impressive. Um, special thanks to uh, Professor Sitsui uh, Margaret Jade and to Professor Lao Kin Chi and the amazing team of organizers, translators, and and others. I mean. Uh, I wish I could, I knew the names, I wish I could have met uh, the translators and organizers as well. Uh, but the few that I, 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 I have conversed with is, is uh, Mu Hong uh, and uh, Zhao Mei, but there's also Omid, Marie and so on. Uh, so very special thanks to, to you all. It's you who make this really possible. So thank you. As uh, previously, we have two speakers in this session. Uh, speaking more or less on the same themes uh, together, which is going to make it a, a really interesting um, seminar. <clears throat> Our first speaker is uh, uh, Samal Bushi, a political anthropologist based at the uh, University of California in Irvine and a non-resident fellow, fellow at the uh, Quincy Institute, where she has written some very, very interesting short pieces. She's a contributing editor at Africa is a Country and has published her in a wide variety of public outlets on topics ranging from the International Criminal Court to the militarization of the US policy in Africa. Her writing and interviews have, have appeared in The Intercept, Africa is a Country, Al Jazeera, Democracy Now!, Pumbers of the News, Review of uh, Political Economy and Warscapes as well as many other places. So a very warm welcome to you, Samar. Our second speaker is Dr. Brittany Meshe, uh, who is a transdisciplinary scholar working at the intersections of environmental studies, security studies, African diaspora studies, and science and technology studies. Goodness me, I wonder what she does in the afternoons. She currently serves as the Assistant Professor of Environment Studies and Affiliated uh, Faculty in the Science and Technology Studies at Williams College in the US. Uh, Professor Mesha earned her PhD in Geography from the University of California, Berkeley in 2020. Uh, she, uh, re her research examines the politics of environmental expertise, uh, global security projects, 
uh, French and United States Empire and the making of the Black African diasporic world. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, to have you uh, join us today, uh, Brittany. Um, and uh, I pass the floor then to, uh, I think Sama will start uh, the, her presentation and then we'll take uh, Brittany. We will then follow that with, there'll be lots of questions coming from the large audience that we have and we'll summarize them uh, for you. And um, I'll make a few provocative remarks to keep you awake. Um, so over to you, Summer. Uh, I look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Firoz. A huge thank you both to you and to Jade for the invitation to join you all today. And a big thank you to all of the organizers, as well as those of you who are here with us. I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. According to a report published in April 2022 by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, global military spending uh, last year surpassed $2 trillion for the first time. This was the seventh consecutive year of spending increases, with the five largest spenders last year being the United States, China, India, the United Kingdom, and Russia, together accounting for 62% of military expenditures. It's worth noting that no other military force in the world matches that of the United States, which spends more of its military budget than on the next 11 countries combined. US military spending typically represents over 40% of the world's total military spending each year. Despite the economic meltdown brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, African states raised their military spending last year to almost $40 billion. This increase, and I should mention just for now that this particular slide is for 2020, not for 2021. So there's a discrepancy between what you see, but at least you get a sense of the general spending figures. Um, the increase in 2021 was primarily driven by Nigeria, which increased its military spending by 56%, reaching $4.5 billion. South Africa came in second, and Kenya, Uganda, and Angola were respectively the third, fourth, and fifth largest military spending spenders in sub-Saharan Africa last year. So in general, we're witnessing a growing investment in militarism and policing across the continent. These dynamics are closely connected to the so-called war on terror and the militarization of US policy towards Africa in the form of the US Africa Command, otherwise known as AFRICOM. As it's widely known, the US has an unrivaled network of military bases around the world, roughly 800. While these military bases are often pitched to the American public as defensive infrastructures, in reality, they're offensive structures that constitute a key co component of US power projection. In terms of bureaucratic control, the Department of Defense has carved up the world into 11 unified combatant commands. AFRICOM, which was established in 2007 under the Bush administration and became fully operational in 2008 under President Obama, covers the African continent with the exception of Egypt and is designed to extend and protect US political and economic interests in the region. AFRICOM is headquartered in Germany, but operates from a vast network of military bases across the continent. Today, AFRICOM has roughly 29 known military facilities in 15 countries. <clears throat> While there are a growing number of foreign military bases in the Horn of Africa, no other country has as many bases on the continent as the United States. From Mali and Niger to Kenya and Djibouti, the US has set up logistics hubs, forward operating sites, and cooperative security locations. The pins and threads connecting these places on this map help us conceptualize AFRICOM as what Adam Moore and James Walker referred to as a geopolitical assemblage whose everyday functioning across time and space facilitates militarism and war on a global scale. As the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research observes, this map is a visual testament to the continued fragmentation and subordination of the continent's peoples and governments. 
Now, it's important to uh, dissect the rhetoric that is often used to justify AFRICOM and the war on terror more broadly, namely the frame of the war on terror, which has become the defining lens through which the US engages the African continent. The so-called war on terror conceptually divides the world into two spheres, those who engage in quote unquote legitimate violence and those who engage in quote unquote illegitimate violence. Since 9-11, the notion of terrorism has been defined as the opposite of war. And speaking of a war on terror, the US has assumed the role of global policemen, arrogating to itself the right and moral authority to set standards, determine threats, and employ deadly force. Terrorism is framed as simply irrational and evil, uh, whereas war is framed as a legally sanctioned concept. But the scholar Talal Assad pictured here says that in fact, it is not so easy to differentiate one from the other. He questions the supposed difference between war as civilized violence that is subjected to rules, laws, and morals on the one hand, and terrorism as quote unquote barbaric violence on the other. Assad also interrogates the rationale behind the renewed interest in quote unquote just war theory. He reminds us that the notion of just war has its roots in medieval medieval Christian theory that it is used to persuade skeptics that violence is moral and necessary, and he observes that it has been used by liberal democracies like the U.S. to legitimate the war on terror. So what is this war on terror actually about? Scholars and activists now widely recognize that while the official rhetoric that is employed to justify AFRICOM emphasizes its role in working with African partners for a, quote, secure, stable, and prosperous Africa, end quote, the discourse of security effectively functions as a cover for much broader interests. The anthropologist Catherine Besteman uses the term security imperialism to describe the range of policies and practices that are used to pacify and contain so-called risky populations across the world, accompanied by interventions to securitize space for militaristic and economic domination. As she says, quote, these emergent imperial formations are spatial and technological rather than territorial, and they're taking shape through projects that racialize and incarcerate people while securing cosmopolitan class privilege and capitalist extraction across borders. They tether the concept of security to militarization and make the militarization of everyday life normal. Now, the Italian Marxist Silvia Federici puts it much more succinctly, she says, war is on the global agenda precisely because the new phase of capitalist expansionism requires the destruction of any economic activity not subordinated to the logic of accumulation. And this is necessarily a violent process. Now, just briefly to define militarization, Catherine Lutz defines it as involving an intensification of the labor and resources allocated to military purposes including the shaping of other institutions in synchrony with military goals. Militarization is simultaneously a discursive process involving a shift in general societal beliefs and values in ways necessary to legitimate the use of force, the organization of large standing armies and their leaders, and the higher taxes or tribute used to pay for them. Militarization is intimately connected not only to the obvious increase in the size of armies and resurgence of militant nationalism and militant fundamentalisms, but also to the less visible deformation of human potentials into the hierarchies of race, class, gender, and sexuality, and to the shaping of national histories in ways that glorify and legitimate military action. As we know, U.S. military power extends beyond military bases. The U.S. has also worked steadily to transform foreign security forces into extensions of its own power. So it's equally important to attend to the partnerships with African security forces that are empowered to engage in counterterror operations and that often act as surrogates for the U.S. military. Returning to Bestemann's concept of security imperialism, we can think here about how US-led training and capacity building endeavors link domestic policing and carcerality to extra state forms of military intervention, counterinsurgency, and border control. Since the US military's embarrassing exit from Somalia in 1993, the US has shifted from a boots on the ground approach to imperial warfare 
instead relying on African militaries, private contractors, clandestine ground operations, and drone strikes. This dispersal of power effectively functions to make the US military's role less visible and thereby less traceable with clear implications for accountability efforts. I'll now offer some specific examples of what this looks like in East Africa and the Horn. <clears throat> Somalia has been the site of a US-led undeclared war for almost 15 years now. It was under the Bush administration that Somalia became the source of quote unquote concern, but the US government had no intention of placing US troops on the ground at the time. Instead, it invoked the language of partnership and sought to garner support from allies on the continent who would be ready to deploy their own troops to the front lines. Ethiopia, a neighboring state, was first to step up as a quote unquote partner. And with US support, the Ethiopian military invaded Somalia in 2006 dislodging the first stable government that Somalia had had in years. In the immediate aftermath of Ethiopia's invasion of Somalia, hundreds of people fled the violence and many sought refuge in neighboring Kenya. In doing so, they stumbled directly into a transnational border operation in which Ethiopian and Somali ground troops with American air support were channeling people towards an area of the border where many would then be captured. At least 150 men, women, and children from 18 countries were arrested at the Kenya-Somalia border in January of 2007. Weeks later, roughly 85 people were transported on secret flights from Kenya to Somalia and Ethiopia, where many were held for several months and in some cases over a year. Abducted from their police cells, in the middle of the night, they were flown blindfolded and handcuffed on three different privately chartered flights to Somalia and then Ethiopia, where officials from the FBI and CIA awaited them. These were the first publicly documented instances of mass rendition in Africa. So what is rendition? Uh, rendition refers to the government-sponsored abduction and extrajudicial transfer of an individual from one country to another with the purpose of circumventing the former country's laws on interrogation, detention, and torture. This practice has been employed by the United States since 9-11 in relation to individuals it identifies as terror suspects. While we've heard a great deal about the prison at Guantanamo Bay, we hear less about these prison sites where many people were held as terror suspects. As the scholar Daryl Lee reminds us, for each extraterritorial and extraordinary prison like Guantanamo, there are many more ordinary prisons and detention sites run by other governments in their own territory. This means that if we are to focus solely on US actors and spaces in the form of AFRICOM or Guantanamo Bay, that we might miss the wider matrix of militarized violence that is at work, one that is sustained without formal US rule. Here, it's worth pausing to reflect on the astute observations of Ghanaian revolutionary and political theorist Kwame Nkrumah, who employed the term neocolonialism to capture the external systems of domination that in the post-colonial era have continued to undermine meaningful independence and self-rule for Africa and the global South more broadly. As he says, the essence of neocolonialism is that the state which is subject to it is in theory independent and has all the outward trappings of international sovereignty. In reality, its economic system and thus its political policy is directed from outside. Nkrumah characterized neocolonialism as, quote, the worst form of imperialism. For those who practice it, he says, it means power without responsibility. And for those who suffer from it, it means exploitation without redress. Nkrumah's conceptualization of neocolonialism can help us reflect critically on the power dynamics of the so-called partnerships that are at play between the US and many African states today. Far from the idea of equality that the term partnership implies, African partners are continuously subjected to what some have characterized as structural humiliation in their relationships with the US and other Western powers. As Zohar Ahmed observes, the US uses its power as the International Monetary Fund's largest financial contributor as leverage in its negotiations with Global South states, 
to obtain cooperation on the war on terror. Thus, as Ahmed writes, these kinds of international relationships the US cultivates in support of its wars fall somewhere in a legal gray zone between consent and coercion, as economic constraints and continued dependence on foreign credit have compelled African states to make themselves amenable to the needs and priorities of the US. Here we can think about the case of Zambia, which has been struggling with spiraling debt and which recently agreed to host an AFRICOM Office of Security Cooperation. While the US may not have explicitly coerced the Zambian government into reaching this agreement, the country's current economic challenges inevitably influenced this decision. The fact that it was the Zambian government that officially signed on to the agreement with AFRICOM should not distract us from the relations of domination and dependency then make it vulnerable to external influence and manipulation. Now, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, political figures like Kwame Nkrumah warned about the potential for neo-colonial influence and meddling. He stressed the importance of African unity to ensure actual, not simply symbolic independence in the face of neo-colonial forces. With this in mind, Nkrumah proposed the idea of a continent-wide African army. Approximately 30 years later, at a September 1999 summit of the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, Libyan President Muammar Gaddafi reminded his fellow African leaders of Nkrumah's vision and proposed the creation of a United States of Africa with a single army and currency. As we reflect on the visions of people like Nkrumah and Gaddafi, it's important to remind ourselves that the OAU, which was established in 1963, once prided itself on the principle of non-interference. In the early years of independence, African states were committed to respecting the sovereignty and territorial integrity of other member states and viewed international discourse about human rights as a pretext for undermining, undermining their sovereignty. But in the early 2000s, this changed. In 2002, the OAU was replaced by the African Union, which quickly abandoned the principle of non-intervention, reversing the sanctity previously accorded to state sovereignty. This development was closely tied both to the rise of the UN concept of responsibility to protect, which attached moralism to militarism, and to the war on terror. What we've seen since then is an embrace of militarism and intervention, in the name of African ownership and African solutions to humanitarian and human rights concerns. The AU's embrace of intervention in the name of quote unquote security has entailed a growing entanglement with US empire and a deepening imbrication in a transnational military supply chain that reproduces racial capitalism as African troops constitute a racialized labor force whose deaths, injuries, and at times unpaid salaries garner minimal scrutiny. Again, it is precisely African states' readiness to deploy their own troops to perform the labor of war that has been critical to their ability to access development assistance and foreign aid. Countries that have deployed troops to Somalia, for example, have been the recipients of high levels of US financial aid, arms sales, and training opportunities, which has had the effect of increasing the size and lethal capacities of their respective security bodies. <clears throat> And it's worth um, just noting here that African troops are paid up to 10 times the normal salary that they receive back home. In short, when we reflect critically on African states' continued subjection to a racialized hierarchical global order and to conditions of economic indebtedness, we're forced to contend with the structural humiliation that shapes their participation in what is best described as the business of war. <clears throat> I'll return to uh, Somalia in a moment, but first uh, we'll briefly consider the changing nature of imperial warfare. A number of factors have contributed to a shift in tactics with respect to US military intervention on the continent. The first is war fatigue precipitated by failed interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan and calls for a shift to smaller, more focused interventions. The second is the turn to drone technology as a purportedly more precise form of warfare. And the third is networks. Believing that terror suspects operate through diffuse and shadowy networks, the US increasingly believes it needs to employ similar tactics. 
This means that AFRICOM relies more heavily on local partners and private contractors. <clears throat> in Somalia, for example, it is not US troops, but African troops that are on the front lines. The US has trained a special Somali police unit called the Dana Brigade, pictured on the right, made possible by 127E, a fiscal authority that allows the US to work with surrogate forces and that exempts the US military from worrying about human rights safeguards. The Intercept reports that unlike traditional foreign assistance programs, which are primarily intended to build local capacity, 127E partners are then dispatched on US directed missions targeting US enemies to achieve US aims. According to a former senior defense official involved with the program, quote, the foreign participants in a 127 ECHO program are filling gaps that we don't have enough Americans to fill. If someone were to call a 127 ECHO program a proxy detention, it would be hard to argue with them. In Kenya, which is a key US ally in the region, the US military has provided over $400 million in counterterrorism train and equip support to Kenyan security institutions in the past decade. Uh, pictured here is the Rapid Response Team, a clandestine special team of the Kenyan Paramilitary General Service Unit's REC company. This Rapid Response Team was set up, equipped, and trained, and is guided on tactical counterterror operations by the CIA in Kenya. Then we have the Anti-Terror Police Unit, uh, which was formed in 2003 with funding and trainings from the United States and the UK. And the ATPU is a special branch of the Kenyan police that has become notorious for its plain clothed officers that engage in extrajudicial killings and disappearances operating with impunity. And this image here is of a news story describing the uh, killing of one resident of Mombasa on the coast. Now, families and rights activists in search of answers about missing friends or relatives are often told by Kenyan officials that the police are simply following instructions provided to them by outside powers. These examples serve to remind us that the war on terror is as much a form of police action as it is military engagement. This is an important point to reflect on because it helps us realize that a singular fixation with military power has the effect of masking more conventional forms of repressive state violence. Equally important is the indirect nature of US interventionism. Because AFRICOM relies on remote management, it operates through assemblages of different and changing partnerships, which are often plagued by their own tensions. In Somalia, the US has conducted so many trainings of so many security forces over the last 15 years that some of these forces have defected, some have sold their arms on the black market, some work directly with the so-called enemy in the form of the Somali militant group, Al-Shabaab. The result has been the emergence of different forces with different loyalties, many of whom are often engaged in battle with one another rather than with Al-Shabaab. So even if attacks continue to take place in Somalia, it becomes increasingly difficult to know for certain who is responsible. Since the onset of the war on terror, the preemptive killing of terror suspects by drones has created a new class of disenfranchised actors and is symptomatic of a more pervasive phenomenon of preemption as a racialized technology, wherein decisive action in the moment is undertaken to contain and mitigate perceived future threats. It was during the Obama administration that a significant US drone and airstrike campaign in Somalia began coupled with the deployment of US Special Operations Forces inside the country. Now, keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, that the US has never made a formal declaration of war on Somalia. As a consequence, the US government has gone to great effort to rationalize its ability to conduct war in countries that it is not technically at war with. In introducing the term area of active hostilities, the US has sought to redefine the very meaning of war. The ability of the drone to target enemies from above has, in the words of Derek Gregory, reactivated a colonial form of power in a radically new const constellation, as it makes possible an extended occupation rather than a time-limited incursion. When President Trump came into power, he signed a directive that instituted war zone targeting rules 
by expanding the discretionary authority of the military to conduct airstrikes in the country. During Trump's time in office, Southern Somalia became the target of an unprecedented escalation of drone strikes with approximately 900 to 1,000 people killed between 2016 and 2019 and tens of thousands of people displaced. President Biden campaigned with the promise to end endless wars. Soon after he assumed office last year, his administration announced that it would impose temporary limits on the Trump era targeting rules for countries like Somalia in order to conduct an internal review and determine what its own policy would be. But in May of this year, Biden announced that he had decided to maintain Trump's flexible approach to drone warfare in Somalia, one that still gives military commanders the latitude to make decisions without congressional or White House oversight. So Biden's pledge to engage in a comprehensive review of the government's policy on drone strikes clearly did not lead to an ethical reconsideration of the use of drones. What the Biden administration has done is draft new laws and procedures, offering safeguards against civilian bystander deaths that purport to provide protections for adult men, as well as women and children. In this sense, the Biden administration is continuing prior administration's use of the law as a tactic of war, referring to the introduction of new laws and policies in order to suggest that the US makes more of an effort to limit civilian casualties, even as it employs deadly force. As the political establishment in Washington fix, fixates on the minuscule legal debates about whether and how, how war can be fought more humanely, few are questioning the decision to wage war itself. At the same time, it's important to recognize that drones are in many ways the most visible element of imperial warfare in East Africa today. In practice, a whole range of actors and infrastructures, civilians and military alike, are mobilized to expand the reach of the war on terror. This is why analysts like Andrew Basevich in the US context and Rita Abrahamson in the African context write of what they call the new militarism because it's not limited to the institution of the military alone and is often entangled with seemingly benign projects like peace building and what technocrats like to refer to as security sector reform. And Dr. Brittany Mache has written about security sector reform from a critical perspective. Um, take Somalia as an example where the African Union with a mandate from the UN oversees a peacekeeping mission that has effectively served as a cover for a seemingly endless military occupation. When global news outlets cover the war against Al-Shabaab, they tend to focus only on US drone strikes but this so-called peacekeeping mission with over 20,000 troops from five African states conducts counterinsurgency operates, operations and bombing campaigns that are just as destructive in terms of displacement and loss of life. So what is Amazon? In 2007, soon after the Ethiopian military invaded Somalia, the UN authorized an African Union peacekeeping mission known as Amazon to stabilize Somalia. It began as a small deployment of roughly 1,600 troops, but by 2014, the number exceeded 22,000. The troops come from Uganda, Ethiopia, Burundi, Djibouti, and Kenya. And while Amazon's initial rules of engagement permitted the use of force only when necessary, it gradually assumed an offensive role, engaging in counterinsurgency and counterterror operations. Some of Amazon's troop contributing states have maintained a separate contingent of troops that conduct their own aerial assaults against Al-Shabaab in Somalia. In 2017, for example, the UN alleged that unauthorized Kenyan airstrikes had contributed to at least 40 civilian deaths in a 22 month period between 2015 and 2017. When Al-Shabaab retaliates with further attacks, analysts use this as a demonstration that the Somali security apparatus is, quote, not yet capable of securing the country on its own. It's here that we see how the language of training, capacity building, and professionalization becomes an alibi for endless war. It's on this basis that the UN decided to extend the mandate of the peacekeeping mission earlier this year, and it renamed the operation ATMIS with the language of transition in the title now and characterizes ATMIS as a quote, more agile, more mobile, more flexible mission with a mandate running through December, 2024. <clears throat> I'll conclude with a reflection on the broad and long-term impact of the US led war on terror for the continent. 
Up until 9-11, few African states were threatened by external actors on the continent. But the war on terror has fundamentally reoriented regional calculations about security, and years of training by AFRICOM has produced a new generation of security actors that are both ideologically oriented and materially equipped for war. Because the US and its European allies rely so heavily on many of these states, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda as some examples for the war on terror, political and military elites in these countries have been able to consolidate their power in a way that is largely immune from external scrutiny and critique. For example, in October of 2011, the Kenyan military invaded neighboring, neighboring Somalia with the stated purpose of addressing the threat posed by al-Shabaab. This was the first time in the country's history that it had engaged in active combat abroad. While the US did not actively encourage the invasion, it did not condemn it either, knowing that it relies so heavily on Kenya for security related matters in the region. Within a few months, Kenyan officials were forced to contend with the financial cost of their operations. So when the AU agreed to incorporate Kenyan troops into Amazon, it both conferred legitimacy for maintaining a military presence in Somalia and deflected the cost of its operations onto the African Union's international donors. In the meantime, as has been widely documented now, Kenya has colluded with al-Shabaab in the illicit cross-border trade in sugar and charcoal. In short, like other actors that have become involved in Somalia, Kenya has used its presence on the ground to pursue its own economic interests. While the political economy of endless war in Somalia is garnering increasing attention, there's been comparatively less focus on the significance of militarism and war for political identity and subject formation. In his book, When Victims Become Killers, Mahmoud Mamdani grapples with the question of post-colonial political identity formation and its relationship to violence. While Mamdani once believed that the primary impact of colonialism had been economic, he explains that the li limits of political economy as a framework came to the fore as he wrestled with non-revolutionary political violence that cut across social classes, as evidenced in the case of the 1994 Rwandan genocide. Yet Mamdani was also skeptical of cultural theories of conflict that traced the root causes of such violence to cultural difference, often framed in the language of tribe or ethnicity. Few scholars, he said, historicized the political legacy of colonialism as a complex that framed and set in motion particular political identities. Political identities, he observed, are the consequence of how power is organized. Mamdani's insistence that we wrestle with the question of political identity is critical, particularly in an era that is characterized by the ordinariness and banality of war. Over the past 10 and a half years since the Kenyan state invaded Somalia, it has displayed what can best be described as a missionary zeal as it sees itself as a leader ordained with special responsibilities related to security. This points to militarism's cultural and ideological aspects and to the growing symbolism attached to the Kenyan military and public life, evidenced here in these images. I'm interested in how the rise of self-declared leaders like Kenya is productive of new forms of difference, thereby exacerbating divisions on the continent. We see signs of this in the way that Kenya actively works to distinguish itself from so-called failed states like Somalia. While not explicitly invoking race, the language of failed states is informed by and produces racialized ideas about place and space. Here we can begin to see how US exceptionalism namely that the US is both distinct from and superior to other countries, feeds off of and simultaneously gives rise to other exceptionalisms, as we've seen in Israel in relation to Palestine, in India in relation to Kashmir, and increasingly in Kenya in relation to Somalia, where the Kenyan state has engaged in indiscriminate forms of policing and counterinsurgency against Somalis at home and abroad. The struggle to bring an end to militarism and endless war will require, in the words of Chandra Mohanty, an alternative vision of connectivity and solidarity that includes building ethical, cross-border, and feminist solidarities that confront neoliberal militarization globally. Thank you. Thank you for that, Summer. Lots of questions that uh, emerge from that, but I think what I'll do is hold them off until um, 
uh, we've heard from Brittany. Um, but uh, clearly, you've done a lot of work in in putting together that material, and that, that's I think something that will be deeply appreciated by everyone who has been uh, uh, watching the show. Um, so a, a, a warm thanks to you, Summer. I really appreciate what you've um, you've done. Um, Perhaps we can um, invite uh, Brittany Masher to 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 make her presentation um, if uh, she is if she is ready. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say thank you again for everyone for making time to be here today. It really is wonderful to be in this space. Um, I want to thank Feroz and Jade for coordinating these important series of conversations. Thank you to my co-presenter Samar for just an incredibly rich talk, which I think will, will lead to a robust um, discussion in a bit. Um, so today I'll be sharing material from my in progress book entitled Sustainable Empire, Nature, Knowledge and Insecurity in the Cell. The book examines the intersections of transnational security projects and environmental politics amid the afterlives of empire in West Africa. And I would like to open with an event that some of you in attendance might recall. So on October, October 4th, 2017, four members of a US Armed Special Forces team were killed alongside four Nigerian soldiers and one interpreter during an ambush in rural Niger near the Malian border. According to ensuing international media coverage, the soldiers came under fire from fighters affiliated with the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, one of several armed groups operating across the West African Sahel. These deaths mark the single largest number of American combat casualties in an African country since the disastrous intervention in Somalia in 1993, which Dr. Hadoushi discussed a bit. And the events in Niger exemplify a broader process of securitization taking place across the Sahel. The US soldiers belong to a roughly 800 troop presence in the country, conducting training exercises, assisting French and Nigerian troops with raids and surveillance missions, and constructing a multi million dollar drone base in northern Niger, hailed as the single largest infrastructure project ever built by the American Air Force. In the United States, reports about the 2017 attack emphasized the widespread shock of both lay citizens and members of Congress that US troops were fighting in a seemingly faraway place like West Africa. One relative of the deceased soldiers remarked, quote, you don't think of your military in Africa. You're talking to people who didn't even know how to pronounce Niger. We had to look it up on the map to see exactly where it happened. And perhaps more than any other US military venture in modern history, the decades long war on terror operates through a particular geographical ignorance that geographer Neil Smith identified as a hallmark of the American empire. In the continent of Africa, an increasingly aggressive front in the global war on terror occupies a contradictory place in the political imaginaries of the US public. In a report published by the New York Times following the attack in Niger, the authors note, quote, the deadly ambush in October happened on a continent still largely viewed through the lens of humanitarian catastrophes, a place where most Americans are accustomed to expending dollars, not lives. And and it is from this portrayal of the presumed immiseration and ongoing catastrophes of African spaces that the authors gesture towards an overarching question. Why did four US soldiers die in a remote African desert? This formulation implies both a tacit critique of the US's unending war while also questioning the types of terrain that US security forces come to occupy. The reference to an African desert is revealing. Throughout the New York Times piece, the authors repeatedly invoke the remoteness of the Nigerian landscape with images of a barren, harsh desert 
threaded through the accounting of how the soldiers met their eventual ends. According to the report, the soldiers were in search of water when they happened upon a village whose residents alerted Islamic State fighters. The tone of the piece is haunting, punctuated with repeated allusions to an unforgiving Sahara, with its heat, its dust, and its lack of water. If the fighters affiliated with the Islamic State represent one villain in this story, it seems that the physical landscape indexes another. Deserts have become the defining physical environments of global security projects in the 21st century. In our present moment, the contours and after effects of contemporary militarism extend into and throughout the globe's dry lands, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Libya, and the West African Sahel. Now, the boundaries of a region called the Sahel remain contested. For some scholars, the Sahel spans from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. But for the purposes of my presentation today, the West African Sahel refers to the large expanse of countries bordering the southern edge of the Sahara, so stretching from Senegal and Mauritania in the west to Chad in the east. And since the early 2000s, across the Sahel, counterterrorism and anti-organized crime initiatives have grown exponentially, initially led by France, the European Union, the United States, and various United Nations agencies. These efforts have dramatically changed the scope and character of foreign engagement. In 2005, the United States government launched the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership, a series of joint Department of State, U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and Department of Defense Africa Command, AFRICOM programs, which partner with countries in the Sahel and provide military and police trainings, surveillance, and intelligence assistance. Similarly, the French Ministry of Defense launched operations Serval and Barkhane in 2013 and 2014 respectively, deploying several thousand troops across the Sahel. In addition to powerful states, numerous international governing bodies have instituted, instituted long-term programs to combat terrorism, including the European Union's Security and Development Strategy for the Sahel, which was in 2008, and the United Nations Integrated Strategy for the Sahel, launched in 2012. However, prior to the present counterterrorism moment, the Sahel was most known to outsiders for a series of droughts and devastating famines that took place in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The effects of these famines in the Sahel cannot be overstated. In addition to the staggering loss of life, an estimated 1.2 million dead and millions more displaced, the famines also produced new architectures of global power. Scholars Alexander Duval, Gregory Mann, and A.L. Weisman argue that the expansive transnational humanitarian aid industry originated from this moment of the Sahelian famines. Additionally, the United States became the single largest contributor to famine relief as part of its post-World War II ascendancy in global politics. The U.S. also financed new investments in the environmental science of extreme environments, primarily deserts and Arctic areas. And this laid the groundwork for the future scientific discovery of global warming. Thus, in the wake of the famines, the Sahel became the site of intense academic scrutiny and environmental study about the causes of drought, about land use policy, and about building a more robust agricultural system. Thus, when I began research for this book, my primary question was, how do the raft of new actors in the Sahel concerned with various security projects interface with these other kinds of entrenched networks of environmental expertise. What I did not anticipate and what became the central orientation of my research was the extent to which the numerous experts I interviewed framed ideas about insecurity in the Sahel through a range of environmental discourses about the region's past, its present, and its predicted future. The conceptual orientation and overall methodology of my work reveal a commitment to study up to sites of power, 
and a desire to illuminate the material context and everyday practices of expertise. This methodological approach is partly informed by the work of Timothy Mitchell, who argues, quote, expert knowledge works to format social relations, never simply to report or picture them. So my book draws on 26 months of multi-sided fieldwork in six countries and utilizes qualitative social science research methods, including structured and unstructured interviews with institutional actors and experts, observations at workshops, conferences, and security trainings, and content analysis of policy documents. And through these materials, I've developed the following major claim, and that is environmental discourses about the Sahel work to naturalize insecurity. That is, they conceptualize the region as predisposed to violence and disorder because of the perceived limitations of the physical environment. This, in turn, legitimates indefinitely security projects aimed at stability, order, and population management, management while undermining claims to equity, justice, and repair. So this is an argument that I developed over the course of, of an entire book. Um, but for today, I would like to do three things to, to illustrate the kinds of analytics and evidence that I'm using to, to really develop this, this argument. So first, I will briefly introduce an analytic that I'm calling the Imperial Ecologies of Arid Spaces to show the kinds of discursive practices about arid and semi-arid environments that animate outside engagement with the Sahel. Next, I will outline debates about desertification, a contested scientific phenomenon with profound social and political effects. And then finally, I will conclude with an illustrative case involving a pair of colleagues working at the regional headquarters of the United Nations Agency based in Dakar, Senegal. I will use this case to demonstrate how the research subject I interviewed talk about their work in relation to ideas of the physical environment. And then I will use this case to orient some of my concluding remarks about the overall state of my work. The abiding appeal of representing the Sahara as a barren wasteland harkens back to Western imperial ideas that emerged in the 18th and 19th centuries. British and French colonial expeditions in North and West Africa popularized images of the areas flanking the world's largest hot desert as dangerous and inhospitable for human life. And accounts produced by geographers, travel writers, natural scientists, and anthropologists the desert itself became a fulcrum to imperial conquest, as these texts presented the desert as both alluring and terrifying in its exoticism. The iconography of the Sahara became, and in certain ways remains, linked to images of intrepid white men either succumbing to or overcoming the dangers of the desert. Indeed, early forms of climate science were preoccupied with concerns about racial acclimatization. That is, whether Europeans could survive the climatic conditions in their colonies. Colonial incursions in the dry lands significantly altered the social, economic, and political trajectories of these spaces. The Sahel, in particular, has been framed as a transitional space ecologically, where the desert meets the savanna, racially, where Black and Arab Africa meet, and religiously, as a convergence of Islam, Christianity, and animism. This threatening liminality was seen as a challenge to be overcome through imperial governance. The peculiar mix of Orientalist fantasies about the desert, coupled with attempts to control and render profitable new colonial holdings, ultimately had a lasting impact on how these areas were understood by outsiders. Instead of conceiving arid and semi-arid regions as complex social, cultural, political, and ecological worlds, colonial surveyors came to define these areas as degraded, disastrous, and indeed foreign rule. Relatedly, the numerous residents living in Saharan spaces were conceptualized as 
predisposed to violent conflict. Forms of environmental determinism, that is ideas linking racial difference, natural difference, and livelihood, became especially salient as colonial expeditions helped affirm the desert as a catastrophic theater and Western environmental thought. This ideological co-emergence of racial and environmental difference helped undergird claims to imperial authority. Degradation narratives in particular, which positioned indigenous communities as poor stewards of the environment, led to large-scale sedentarization and resettlement schemes alongside new environmental codes to usurp land and extract resources. The problematic character of the landscape for French imperial governance furthered ideas about the presumed barbarity of both people and place. The eventual conquest and consolidation of French West Africa in 1904 helped establish the region as a simultaneous environmental and military problem. The new counterinsurgency strategies developed during the Saharan campaigns came to characterize French military doctrine from the late colonial era through World War II and culminated, and culminated with the Algerian War. Arid environments became sites of imperial innovation and emergent military knowledge about these areas spawned new ideas about space and governance. Furthermore, as historian George Trumbull demonstrates, processes of political control along the Sahara cannot be divorced from attempts at environmental mastery through technology. Trumbull's research shows how a series of borehole and irrigation projects attempted to make the desert suitably productive for empire. So for the purposes of my work, I theorized this particular admixture of environmental science, racial thought, and military conquest as the imperial ecology shared spaces. And its effects reverberate in unexpected ways into the present. And one of those ways, which is to what I now turn, is debates about desertification. At the most basic level, desertification as an idea seems simple enough. The United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification defines desertification as, quote, land degradation in arid, semi-arid, and dry subhumid areas resulting from various factors, including climatic variations and human activities, end quote. Stated another way, desertification is the term most often used to describe the deleterious changes occurring in dry land areas. But the origin story of desertification cannot be divorced from the history I just traced. The term was first coined by French colonial forester, Louis Lavaudin, while working in French-occupied North and West Africa. As the work of geographer Diana Davis has shown, Lavaudin theorized the Sahara as spreading southward as a result of indigenous misuse of the land particularly over grazing and deforestation. In the wake of formal decolonization, colonial era scientists were incorporated within the United Nations system as ostensibly post-colonial environmental experts, and they contributed to agenda setting in ways that helped augur what geographer Diana Davis has called the age of desertification in the 20th century. Consequently, the the discursive appeal of an advancing desert retains traction in colloquial uses of the term desertification, even as scholars have attempted to more clearly articulate its meaning. What has emerged in the present is a forceful debate about the clarity and utility of the term itself. According to Roy Benke and Michael Mortimer, Mortimer quote, if desertification denotes an environmental crisis consisting of irreversible degradation on a subcontinental scale, then the most significant thing about desertification in the Sahel is that it never happened, end quote. They continue, while degradation is certainly a reality in the Sahel, 
at some localities with respect to certain components of the environment. There is no evidence of a catastrophic regional environmental crisis. Existing data do not support the claim that the African Sahel is a desertification hotspot, end quote. Now, my interest as a social scientist here is not to adjudicate the veracity of the concept of desertification, nor is it to discount what I see as the very real and deleterious environmental changes taking place in the contemporary Sahel. Instead, taking my cue from science and technology studies and critical political ecology, my interest is in how critiques of desertification flag a moment of scientific uncertainty, while also indexing the power-laden relations that inform the categories used to represent physical environment. Yet these questions of scientific uncertainty, colonial histories, and discursive power were absent in how I encountered ideas about desertification during fieldwork. The experts I interviewed understood their work as taking place in a region becoming more and more arid. And the presumed terrors of land turned desert appeared throughout my interviews. These discursive circulations of desertification pushed it beyond a more circumscribed scientific definition. For instance, on particularly dusty days during Harmattan season, Informants would quip, well, with desertification, this is just going to get a lot worse. Desertification became a way for experts working on a range of seemingly unrelated issues, issues from border management, counterterrorism, governance reforms, to talk about the worst yet to come from Sahel. So as I move to my next section, I now turn to a pair of ethnographic vignettes from fieldwork that eliminate, that eliminate how um, to invoke the work of climate change scholar Candace Callison, how desertification comes to matter in these alternate spheres. Eddie is gregarious with an easy smile and deep set blue eyes. Always quick with a joke or a wink, he often spends his afternoons beachside drinking beers with the US Marine contingent stationed at the American Embassy in Dakar, Senegal. A former US law enforcement official and military reservist, he now works as a senior law enforcement and security expert at the regional headquarters of the United Nations Agency based in Dakar. On a sunny afternoon, I met with Eddie at one of his favorite seaside haunts to discuss his work in the Sahel. Our conversation opened with Eddie recounting his travels in the region, the field visits to countries throughout West Africa, the dozens of trainings he had conducted with local law enforcement, soldiers, and border guards. He described his work with the UN as providing a more exciting life for a retiree who was staying in the US and collecting a pension. Our interview quickly turned more somber as Eddie described what he saw as the entrenched dysfunction across the Sahel. He presented a region awash in guns where human trafficking thrives and where local politicians were more concerned with personal enrichment than responding to the needs of their communities. For Eddie, terrorism and trafficking in people and weapons were opportunistic ways to make a living amid limited options. He doubted how many fighters affiliated with armed groups were true believers of any particular version of Islam. He further levied critiques at foreign experts working in the region as, quote, not being serious, end quote, in the face of what he saw as the Sahel's insurmountable problem, even as they relished their well-paid status as foreign experts. When I asked Eddie his assessment about how the situation in the Sahel would look in 10 years, he responded, quote, it's going to look really bad, especially with the population growth. Niger, it's really bad. Global warming, desertification, it's just bad. I think it would be okay if we had an agricultural revolution like in the US. In the 1960s, there was a panic about population in the US. And then we had an agricultural revolution 
Monsanto came to the rescue. But I don't think that Monsanto can save these guys in the damn desert. And the desert is getting bigger every year because of global warming. And healthcare is better, so less and less children are dying. Soon, we're going to have all of these uneducated, frustrated young men who are the most dangerous people on earth. If they all had girls, it would be okay. Young men with all of this energy, and where are they going to channel it? End quote. Eddie's prognosis invokes the Malthusian nightmare of runaway population growth and a callous indictment of, of all things, improvements in maternal health care. And lest anyone think of Eddie's point here as a cruel anomaly, other interview subjects offered similar statements about improved access to health care leading to more problems for the cell. But I also want to highlight how Eddie's ideas are brought just by imaginings of a spreading desert. He repeats at length, and as a matter of fact, that the spread of the desert at least correlates even if he does not claim causality with an increased threat of violence. Eddie traces what he sees as the limits of agrotech. Monsanto has met its match here. And he rejects a utopian vision of technological innovation as the answer to environmental change. It seems his most forceful conviction is in a future of violence. Moreover, in his appeal to America's past, Eddie's statements also work through a kind of temporal slippage that I encountered time and again throughout my interviews, where the Sahel was pre presented as simultaneously the perpetual past and a kind of developmentalist logic that seeks to catch the region up through foreign aid, and also as a space portending a calamitous future a geographical warning about what the world could become. And this is what I, I theorize in the book as a, a kind of more perverse and disquieting rendering of what's been called Afrofuturism. But in the moment, I was struck by Eddie's casual tone and the disorienting effect of discussing the anticipated collapse of the Sahel while sitting in an upscale cafe, gazing out over the bright blue Atlantic. My informants often described Senegal as, quote, the last man standing, end quote, in a region quickly deteriorating. And this paradoxical positioning of Dakar is perhaps further illustrated by the city's appearance on the New York Times' list of 52 places to visit in 2019. That article enjoins readers to see Dakar while they can as, quote, climate change and a booming population may take their toll, end quote. Like Eddie, the Times piece suggests that Senegal and the greater region to which it belongs may ultimately do. A short walk from the beach in a top floor office in a stark white building, I met with Eddie's colleague, Julian. More serious and reserved than his American counterpart, Julian's soft voice was inflected with a, soft, with a slight Dutch accent. During our interview, he shifted uncomfortably in a chair much too small for his tall, lanky frame. Julian previously worked for the UN in Afghanistan and Pakistan before arriving in the West African Sahel. I began by asking Julian to describe his overall assessment of the region, and he offered, quote, if you look at the needs of the Sahel in general, they are so tremendous and so enormous that there is not enough money in the world to deal with that. Everything that can go wrong with human development goes wrong in the Sahel. And the way it looks for the future is only going to get worse because there are so many people who are born in this region every day. If it's not a crisis already, it's going to be. It's going to be an incredible crisis with pressures feeding into violence, into migration, that's all just going to get worse. When I described this assessment as overly pessimistic, Julian countered, quote, I think the Sahel program and this office functions very well. I think there is currently a lot of political will among governments in the region to be constructive about addressing the challenges they face. 
even though you describe my perspective as pessimistic, I think the area we are operating in is fairly positive. Within the zone we control, within our garden, I think it's working out very well. My pessimism is about where that garden is located. And that garden is located in a massive desert where it will be impossible to irrigate it with all the money, water, and goodwill in the world. And what is our little garden going to contribute to all of that? I'm not sure. Julian's garden metaphor is evocative and in many ways recalls discourses of desertification and how he narrates his work as carving out programmatically a patch of arable space sheltered from the advance of the desert. The metaphor also reveals how assessments about insecurity in the Sahel routinely and paradoxically double back on themselves. For security as presented as the prerequisite for sustainable development, while at the same time, the physical environment is continually framed as the ultimate security challenge of the Sahel. But while I initially thought of this framing as perhaps just a clever turn of phrase, when I asked Julian about the single most important challenge facing the Sahel, he further elaborated his thoughts about the desert. Quote, on the top of my list, the impact the population growth is going to have on the borders of Europe. It's not bad to have a growing population. It's bad to have a growing population and no opportunities. Those people are going to have nothing to do. It's a desert. There's hardly anything that grows. And then maybe they can grow a little bit more, but there's a finite limit and the opportunities for the growing population are going to end in the Sahel. If you're in Nigeria or Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire, somewhere along the coast, then it's a completely different thing. If you go to Congo, there it's management that's the problem. It's things not being well organized, it's governance. But those are problems where the people who are there can provide the solutions to it. There is not an entity in the world that can provide sustainable employment opportunities for the people yet to be born in the Sahel. That's not those governments, that's not the World Bank, that's not the United Nations. What is going to be the solution for those people? To move. And then they may move to Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, but they are also going to move to Europe. Europe, as we can see, is an increasingly hostile place towards migrants. And the way that that debate is going, it's naval ships patrolling the Mediterranean waters, end quote. So contra his colleague Eddie's gendered and indeed racial fears about a growing population of Black African boys and men, Julian situates his own unease about population growth within the landscape itself. For him, the productive capacity of the desert is limited and therefore migration and violence emerge as the twinned responses to the finitude of nature. Furthermore, according to Julian, security op operations like the armed naval patrols he mentioned were the primary interests of major funders and powerful states within the UN system. And that these kinds of interventions dominated the agenda for the region. Of his own work, Julian confessed that prioritizing counterterrorism had garnered significantly more money than other kinds of projects. Towards the end of our conversation, Julian expressed his hope that Europe would eventually become more welcoming to migrants, given what he saw as an inevitable increase in the numbers of people leaving the Sahel. But he also voiced concerns about a future of increased war and violent conflict, he described terrorism in the region as a, pro a protracted form of warfare, a signal of an even greater catastrophe in the making. So to conclude, I want to pick up on Eddie and Julian's speculative gestures about the coming catastrophe in the Sahel to pose a question, and that is who, what institutions, governing bodies, epistemic communities is preparing to govern a catastrophic future. 
inundated as we are with numerous popular invocations of impending global catastrophes, that is the catastrophe of climate change, the catastrophe of migration, the catastrophe of terrorism. My work illustrates how imaginaries of environmental catastrophe and planetary vulnerability work to embolden and legitimate the expansion of security regimes. So in my talk today, I have demonstrated the dispersive and material entanglements of arid environments and transnational security interventions using the analytic framework of the imperial ecologies of arid spaces, tracing debates about desertification and offering a close reading of a pair of ethnographic scenes. I've argued that environmental discourses about the Sahel were naturalized insecurity to present the region as the horizon of a catastrophic future. This facilitates the growth of security interventions led by soldiers, police, and border guards, while leaving unacknowledged historical and on for ongoing forms of exploitation that have produced African spaces as especially vulnerable to the effects of environmental change. So throughout my broader research, I argue attention must be paid to the growing centrality of African spaces within these transnational security discourses that link worsening environmental strain with growing numbers of disaffected potential terrorists, quote unquote, and increased outward migration. And I frame this in particular as a productive site from which to view how a host of disparate local challenges are conscripted within a broader narrative about an insecure globe. Thus, my long-term goal as a progressive-minded scholar is to develop new conceptual tools that center African spaces within debates about climate change by emphasizing three things. First, histories of colonial science and environmental expertise Second, the unequally distributed environmental vulnerabilities produced by empire and racial capitalism. And then third, how security projects offered as solutions often reproduce violent inequities. So ultimately, what is at stake in this work and in my research more broadly is elucidating the politics of climate change in an age of permanent war. That is, I intend to further explore how the power relations inherent to the unfolding processes of environmental change are sutured to large scale investments, that is economic and natural resource investments, but also cultural investments in global militarism. If we are disturbed and indeed horrified by the circumstances that have brought us to what many describe as our present climate emergency, and I'm speaking to you from France, where the southern half of the country is currently on fire. Um, we should also be equally disturbed by some of the solutions that are on offer. Um, and this includes turning a critical eye towards beguiling a war of security and its multiple valences. So I will stop there and I look forward to our discussion. Well, good gracious me. Um, that is quite a, uh, quite a presentation. I mean, I, I, I think this um, this opening of one's eyes about the, the the I can't find another word for it fundamentally racist imageries about the Sahel, uh, about the nature of of desertification, um, and uh, yeah, um, Malthus is uh, uh, rising up again. It seems uh, on the on the debates on on on. Um, uh, population growth, and I think we we need to remind people of one of the earliest lectures uh, uh, by Professor uh, Somet, who who demonstrated that by 1960, the period roughly the end of 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 formal colonialism, uh, the population of Africa was smaller than it was in the year 800 AD. And, and I think that needs to be put in perspective uh, as, as, as well. Um, 
And, and I think it gives us a, a, a fresh view, another way of looking at the debates around climate change. Uh, and, I, and I think your contribution is, is really important. And, and thank you for, for helping us see that. We really look forward to your book. Goodness me, this is a, um, going to be quite extraordinary. Uh, both of you uh, have made uh, some extraordinarily important uh, contributions here. We have lots of questions from the 5,000, nearly 6,000 people who are uh, engaged and, and uh, we'll try and get, get through them all. But, but before we do that, I, I'd just like to, there are a few things which, um, well, only one major thing and, and, and that I'd like to pose, especially to Samar, but I think it touches on, on you as well, Brittany. When we talk about uh, neo-colonialism and, you know, clearly we're, we're talking about the US, its, 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 its role its, and, and the role of Europe, et cetera, and so on. There's always this tendency for us to, to point the figure outside. You know, the African expression, when you point one finger, the other fingers point back at you. And I think this is there's a really important aspect which I'd like to pose to you as, as, a, as a something for discussion. And that is to recognize that in the period of the emergence of neo-colonialism, we have an elite, a ruling class that has a material interest in its collusion with capital. It has a material interest. It's not being bullied by the IMF. It is benefiting from the policies of the IMF. It is not being bullied by the World Bank. It is. It enjoys the fact that the, that they are now richer. This elite is now richer than ever before and the mass of people are more immiserated. Now, I think we're talking about security. We're talking about the militarization of the continent. We're talking about the ideological uh, offensive around, around uh, desertification and so on. We have to recognize, I would suggest, the, 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 the role of our elite. We cannot just talk about countries being exploited. It is our own elites who are exploiting our people as well, uh, and in collusion with, uh, with capital, I would argue. Um, before I go on to the next other questions, let me get some responses from the two of you. Thank you for that question, Firoz. And I just want to thank the interpreters. I apologize that I wasn't speaking slowly enough earlier, but thank you for all of your work. Um, Firoz, that's an excellent and very important question. And in fact, the argument that I make in my book uh, that I didn't mention is that, in fact, imperial warfare, as it is unfolding in East Africa today in Somalia, is co-produced, is co-constituted by both the U.S. military and the, the wider U.S. political establishment and African elites. Um, so to your point, we absolutely have to attend to the very concrete ways in which the ruling class across the continent is benefiting from, um, uh, well, benefiting from a whole set of imperial policies that happen to include now the war on terror. Now, um, I think there are two points that I would say to further elaborate on that. Um, the first is that I think we have a lot to gain by studying in, in concrete detail what the role of African poli political elites um, mean and, and, and the effect that it has. And I say that partly as um, somebody who's interested in provincializing and decentering Europe and the United States in order to better understand how you know dynamics in the world uh, emerge in the way that they do, and it is only by decentering Western actors that we can better understand uh, the role of African elites play. And and I, I say this coming from the perspective of um, 
people who theorize world making, for example, which we tend to think in more romanticized terms during the colonial era, when there was a lot of emphasis on the role played by global South leaders, um, it cites like the Bandung Conference, et cetera, in re-envisioning a more just and a more equitable world. Now, I think there's a tendency, a lingering romanticism that those of us uh, who study empire and imperialism tend to attribute to um, anti-imperial and more revolutionary forms of world making. And I would argue that African leaders today continue to be engaged in forms of world making that happen to be counter-revolutionary um, and that we equally need to be studying and paying attention to that. Now, if I could just briefly push back to your question on the notion that they're not being bullied, that African leaders are not being bullied by the IMF, I want to give one concrete example of what I would call a form of bullying, and that is this uh, recent bill passed in the House of Representatives in the United States called the Countering Malign Russian Activities in Africa Act. And that bill calls for the US to monitor agreements reached between African countries and the Russian government. Um, and this effectively is um, reducing Africa to the, to the realm of great power conflict, wherein the US is only interested in um, studying, following, engaging what is happening on the continent through the lens of its competition with powers like Russia and China. And effectively, the US is saying, we are, we are gonna monitor you and we're going to punish you if you don't do uh, what we want, which is effectively don't partner with Russia and China and only work with us. Thanks. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, uh, Brittany, do you want to react I, to it? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of just quickly, so I, I um, really support um, what Samar's offered. I also, I, I have kind of two points I would make. So first, when I'm teaching my students, I often say, you know, no form of empire works without sort of colluders, right? The, the kind of history of French occupied West Africa is a history of using soldiers from other colonies to make new colonies, right? So I think thinking about the kind of long durée of kind of collusion across military trainings and using soldiers strategically I think is is really important um, thinking about the history of, of especially the Sahel. Um, but I'm also curious about the kind of forms of elitism that um, are both kind of fortified while presenting themselves as anti-imperial. So I'll give you a, a kind of example. Um, I was recently in Niger and there's a new kind of fancy five-star hotel that is in Niamey which um, has served as a kind of site for um, military conferences, military training, soldiers who come in and out, but has also become a kind of leisure site for a, a kind of strata of Nigerian elites who are making different kind of resource extraction deals. So thinking about things like uranium, there are all kinds of like oil futures pros prospecting that are going on in the country. So. And yet those actors are not kind of formally either sort of government, some of them are, some of them are not. Um, they're not kind of formally implicated through things like security forces. And yet there's a way that a kind of hardening of specific sites throughout a city like Niamey, but also in a place like Burkina Faso has written about, provides new forms of leisure for a kind of emergent sort of class that sees itself as um, sort of worldly in certain ways. So the chapter in the book that I'm really thinking through this is called Afropolitan Insecurities and thinking about the kind of making of a kind of Afropolitan idea, which is this kind of class of people who are able to, you know, do their training in, in Europe and then, you know, are of Senegalese heritage and then pop up in New York, but then come back in the ways that certain kinds of securitized sites become the, the kind of sites of their leisure when they're sort of back home, right? And so what do we do with those kinds of actors, even as those actors would present themselves as the kind of avant-garde of, you know, um, artistic fl flourishing in West Africa or the avant-garde of new forms of economic cooperatives, right? So how, how to understand the kind of implication of different kinds of elites who don't necessarily see themselves as, a, as that kind of counter-revolutionary um, elite um, that, Mark talked about. So that's that's kind of what I'm still attempting to kind of parse. What do 
who do we mean by elites and, and how are they sort of implicated in varying forms and sort of security projects. Okay, good, good, that's great. Um, th there are, there, there are, wow, there's lots and lots of really good questions, uh, but, but let me try and bring some clusters of, of those together. Um, I mean, both of you have spoken about, well, painting a picture of uh, a pretty depressing picture. Uh, and, and, and we, but what we, we haven't heard from uh, so much from both of you is, well, yes, but what, what, what resistance is emerging to this? What, uh, what sort of popular movements uh, are, 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 are responding to that? Um, um, do, do, we, um, do we have a, a anywhere uh, what we might recognize in old terms as an anti-war movement? Uh, is, there, is there something that, um, uh, are there movements that are trying to prevent uh, young people becoming seduced into into the sort of uh, militarization complex. Um, uh, are, you know, we've had various kinds of opposition in terms of environment, like Wangari Madai uh, and so on. But but what is happening around the the military military industrial complex, uh, if anything? Sadly, I think that it is difficult to identify any continental-wide um, anti-war, anti-militarization movement. However, we have seen moments um, where people have converged to speak up and to resist. I would think of Ghana in 2018, very soon after the Ghanaian government reached an agreement with the United States to allow the U.S. military unimpeded access to its military facilities. And at that time, thousands of Ghanaians took to the streets in protest, uh, specifically uh, raising concerns about their sovereignty. In a more recent, I would say 2019, 2020, there were protests in Nigeria against the uh, police. The, there was a special uh, police unit in Nigeria that was known for widespread abuses. And that kind of emerged in dialogue with and response to uh, police protests against the police in the United States. So it's interesting to see the ways in which uh, people are inspiring one another to take on these forces. We have also seen protests in Kenya against the anti-terror police unit. And so here, there are a couple of things that I think are worth highlighting. One, it's that people tend to converge and protest in response to uh, uh, forces that are more visible in their daily lives. And that's why we see protests against the Kenyan anti-terror police unit, but not necessarily against the US military, which has a strong presence uh, in Kenya. And it's worth noting the ways in which the US and African governments are compelled to shift their tactics in response to these protests, not necessarily you know, shutting down military bases or um, eliminating the police altogether, they're very strategic, right, in, in deciding that maybe they'll, they will bring an end to one particular specialized police force and then uh, start working with another one. So I think protest is incredibly important, but we also have to attend to the ways in which empire then uh, adjusts in response to it. I just wonder if I can add to that. I mean, um... How, how, how um, Brittany, perhaps, because West Africa is a place that you've been working in, how, how, what's your interpretation of Mali's uh, expulsion of the, of the French? Well, how does that tie into this whole uh, issue? Yeah, I was also going to say that some of the, the most visible forms of opposition to these kind of trends of securitization that we've been seeing are really contradictory, right? So there have been a series of coups that are that have happened in West Africa. Um, Samara and I have spoken about this together. Um, but at times, the sort of military rulers who take over these countries frame themselves as kind of anti-imperial actors, even as they have oftentimes received training from the very empires that they seek to kind of denounce. But they also have an enormous amount of kind of popular support, right? So we could sort of think of 
that as, as a kind of um, anti-imperial sort of agitation, but effectively gets captured by the security forces who have become um, some of the strongest kind of actors in, in these countries. And I'm thinking here of both of Mali and Burkina Faso. Um, but again, it, it becomes, I, I think there are ways that um, sort of denouncing empire becomes a way of securing legitimacy for anti-democratic actors in ways that I think we should be incredibly um, sort of attentive to. Um, but I, but I, I do want to, to kind of um, highlight Samar's note about the kind of morphing and shifting of imperial power, right? So the ouster of France and Mali, there's a kind of change in French policy towards the Sahel, but also a kind of redirecting of forces to Niger, right? And so thinking about the ways that even as these things are presented as quote unquote drawdowns, they are a kind of diffusion of power into kind of neighboring states or again, a kind of re-upping um, investments in local security forces. Um, so those things on the, on their face don't actually kind of get the traction that we that we might, might hope they might have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in in a, in a in a related sense. I mean, uh, uh, Sama, you 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 talked about uh, Nkrumah uh, and then Gaddafi and his ideas of a, a, a unified currency and and military force. Um, to what extent as uh, does that explain uh, the, the the fall of these people? Uh, explain the sort of demise of of Pan Africanism. Uh, in in that context, and the potential for a pan Africanist response being uh, anti imperial as well well as uh, anti capitalist. Yeah, so I think you know we do have to just acknowledge, as you've alluded to, Firoz, much more directly that both Nkrumah and Gaddafi were effectively removed from power uh, because precisely their pan-Africanist ideas represented such a threat to imperial interests. Um, and I think particularly in more recent years, the removal of Gaddafi has had quite a significant impact on the kinds of thinking and the kinds of actions that are coming out of this continental-wide body that is the African Union. Uh, one, because it is so heavily dependent on uh, outside funding, and two, because Gaddafi was, you know, a, a formidable uh, thinker and, and leader in terms of um, inspiring, I think, other African leaders to, to push back. And so at the end of the day, I think, um, sadly, we're not seeing many similar examples of those kinds of leaders today. And if if anything, we're seeing, as Brittany was kind of alluding to a moment ago, invocations of Pan-Africanism that are symbolic uh, only and that are not uh, backed by substance and that are often used as a cover for um, whether it's, you know, um, undemocratic forms of rule or as a cover for violence, as we're seeing in the case of Ethiopia. Yeah, I mean, let me let me just ask. I mean, uh, yeah, um, Nkrumah talked about about uh, dealing with the economic aspect, but you know, we we know that whether we're talking about the United States or Kenya or Mali or whatever, uh, our governments um, tend to be more accountable to the transnationals and international financial. Uh, uh, corporations than they are to the citizens uh, who actually elect them. Um, in in that context, I mean, uh, what I mean, what is, how is it? How do you how do we see this this um, securitization, this militarization, this uh, this ideological offensive around desertification and so on that ties into uh, the interests of capital. For example, you know, somebody asks, how do you evaluate Mon the Monsanto-led agricultural revolution, you know, agra uh, and, and so on. I, you know, uh, um, how is that related to the food crisis that is it that has emerged? Do you want to start, Brittany? Yeah, maybe I'll jump in and, and kind of pick up uh, Samar citing um, Amdani on this point, right? So. In some ways, yes, political economy is, is essential to kind of understanding some of these questions, whether it's kind of resource extraction, the role of the African continent 
in the global economy, the role of financial institutions and in kind of setting the terms in which African countries are able to engage with economic systems. And yet I think, especially for my own work, I'm suspicious of a story that attempts to kind of reduce sort of the imperatives of global militarism to just securing access to resources, right? There are all kinds of actors and interests that are at work that are sometimes at odds with one another that are also invested, right? And so I think since we're, we're kind of doing this in, in, in conversation with um, uh, an institution based in Hong Kong, I think it's important to kind of note the ways that sort of the conventional AFRICOM story gets told is essentially AFRICOM's there to um, strategically outflank China, right? And I think the kind of economic juggernaut that is Chinese influence on the African continent is obviously something that, that we need to take seriously. But I also think that that misses what I alluded to at the end about the kind of cultural investments, especially a kind of cultural investment and in an idea of a fundamentally sort of unstable and violent global society, which needs kind of management. And I think that those kinds of kind of cultural or psychic investments in security as a project that can secure certain kinds of livelihoods is something that I'm really trying to think through and not just kind of reduce it to Africa has all of the resources, Africans coming in to extract those resources and the story, right? I think there, there's far, far more complexity to the story than that, even as the political economy question is, is super important. Shama? I'll just say very briefly, um, that I think this particular moment is um, an incredibly challenging one for African states uh, in the context of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the shutdown of the global uh, supply chains and the food shortages, as you mentioned a moment ago, Firoz. And uh, you know, I, I'm myself, I'm interested to follow closely how African leaders are handling um, this sense of being caught in between and constantly being asked to choose sides as they have to deal with very, very basic concerns and basic needs of their people. Mm, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, one of the things that, uh, when we talk about militarization, um, both of you focus a lot on, 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 uh, on, on the US's role, um, but there's, there's also the, the the expansion of the of the uh, European Union's wall into Africa uh, to prevent migrations, and uh, there's uh, um, there have been a lot of material coming out now about the extent to which uh, the Sahel uh, and uh, the Ethiopian and uh, uh, um, and many other, even the Kenyan, are intensely caught up in providing the, the actual mechanism and are being financed by Europe for the prevention of any migration through, through that. And indeed one book uh, we published a couple of years ago uh, suggested that the number of, that the, 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 the focus on the deaths in the Mediterranean is smaller than the deaths occurring uh, within the African continent as a result of that direct collusion between our elites and their militaries and uh, that. Would you like to comment a little bit more about migration and how that's uh, affecting this whole uh, discussion around security? Yeah, I'll kind of jump in. So I have a, a kind of forthcoming piece, which is specifically about this and about the, the kind of dynamics with regards to climate migration, but I'll say a couple of things. One, there's a way that actors on the ground, folks working for the International Organization of Migration, UN Development Program, UN ODC, a number of actors will readily admit that according to their data, most of the migration that is currently happening is interregional. That it's people moving from Niger to Senegal or from Burkina to Nigeria. And yet they realize with the kind of funding structures for several UN agencies being what they are, that there needs to be an appeal, either an explicit or implicit appeal to the threat posed to Europe by migration in order to secure funding. 
So I had people tell me, right, like the ways that we're able to, to sort of secure funding is by saying, if we do this project in, in Senegal, we'll keep people from going to Italy. If we do this project in Niger, we'll keep people from going to France, right? Even as they themselves acknowledge, well, no, we actually need to be investing in programs in Niger because Niger is, is kind of has a kind of disproportionate number of migrants and how do we kind of support the Nigerian government for how, how do they sort of deal with an influx of people or even internally displaced persons, right? And so I do think, I, I think this is not to discount the very real um, kind of devastating um, deaths that have happened um, in the Mediterranean, the, the kind of horrifying spectacle of the, the kind of images that we've seen, and yet, I think for us to your point, which is the point that I, I really sort of um, speak to in, in my work, I think that often occludes what is actually happening on the ground across the Sahel, and in some ways affirms a project that I've sort of been told by, by diplomats from different European countries, but also the US, that the goal is to keep people on the continent, right? That that, that will be seen as a kind of success, but the kind of circumstances under which people are kind of forced to live is not really consequential right then it becomes a kind of localized problem then it becomes a kind of african problem that needs african solutions and there's a kind of hands as long as you're able to kind of keep people in place in african countries so i think that the migration question is is, is really thorny but um there has been a, a lot of really exciting out about that and sort of encouraging us to really think critically, especially about these narratives that we see about climate change is going to lead to hordes of climate migrants and what are we going to do? You hear this with the United States already, the southern border, we're going to be inundated by climate refugees, right? How, how do we sort of think through some of those discourses given the kind of investments in militarization, border security, securitization that have already been taking place in the last 20, 25 years? Oops. Yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sama. So I just want to uh, focus specifically on Rwanda, which shamefully has uh, reached an agreement with the United Kingdom to receive deported migrants from the UK. Rwanda has agreed to house them um, indefinitely, it seems. And I think this is something we need to monitor closely to find out what actually happens to people who are deported to Rwanda, which itself is known to be a gross violator of human rights. Um, and then to note that at times African states do push back against the role that they're expected to play as warehousers of rejected migrants. And we saw this in Kenya in 2016 when it threatened to close one of its largest refugee camps. Um, we saw the foreign minister make statements about the degree to which Kenya is looking after so many, you know, hundreds of thousands of migrants and refugees and demanding greater international funding in order to support its effort to continue to house them. So what's important here is that all they did was ask for more money, right? They didn't question the very economic policies that are leading people to migrate in the first place. Okay. I mean, one, one of the things that I think, uh, from my limited knowledge of, of the literature, is, is been to hear the voices of of ordinary working people, of uh, of peasants, of those who are whose lives are torn apart by this whole uh, security uh, um, network, and there's, you know, the, somebody's asked a question, you know, is 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 hunger and poverty in Africa directly related to U.S. imperialism and neo-colonialism? I mean, it's a big, big question, um, but those questions about you know the the impact on 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 ordinary people's lives and and to hear their perspectives um i mean perhaps you can give us some idea of where we should be looking for for material that's been published around that um maybe i'll jump in and say so i think it's important to attend to I guess voices that are emerging from the continent who are parts of different kinds of social movements, right? So for me, I've actually seen some of the, the kind of most robust engagement with folks on the ground from the kind of social media activists who are involved in kind of politics. So there are a number of kind of young African women from different countries who have mobilized both 
kind of social media to kind of spread awareness about sort of climate change impacts on the continent, but doing so in, in conversation with folks who are in family villages, who going out and actually talking to farmers, um, talking to pastoralists who've been displaced. Um, so I think those kinds of stories are really important. I also, I, I think this is something that I, I, again, sort of share with my students. I think it's important to not um, obfuscate one's own kind of positionality vis-a-vis -vis these things, right? So in, in my sort of talk, I, I mentioned a kind of commitment to kind of setting up the site of power for, for specific reasons. And I think one of those reasons is that critical commenters within African studies have really balked at the ways that sort of Africans are tasked to play kind of native informant for researchers from Western states, from the US coming and sort of basically in the words of um, Macharia, trawling for resistance, right? What, what are we sort of asking when we sort of show up on the ground and say, tell me the ways that you're fighting empire as opposed to kind of doing our own work and say, what are our own sort of capabilities and complicities with empire, both as scholars who, who kind of study this, but also as beneficiaries of the empire, right? I'm able to kind of travel in the region because I have a US passport. I'm, I'm able to, you know, be here as a presenter, as an expert because of the, the kind of training that I received from elite US institutions, right? And so I, I think for my own research, I've, I've really attempted to kind of carve out a sphere where I feel like I'm able to both leverage my own privilege to critically think about kind of large structures while also of course being informed by people on the ground who are doing this work but not presuming to, to kind of speak for those people through my work right i'm hoping to work in solidarity alongside them by turning my attention to a kind of different set of actors um, but this is not to say that those perspectives are not important and there are people who are attempting to kind of do do this this kind of work Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Samar, do you want to um, final words on, on this? Yeah, just two points I'll make about um, what I see as the challenges facing activists and social movements on the continent. Uh, the first would be um, surveillance. That's an element that we didn't talk about, but that is uh, playing a growing role in Africa today in terms of technologies of surveillance, intercepting phone calls, following, monitoring social media. And this has a, um, a dampening effect on, on activism, right? Um, for not, um, for obvious reasons, in the sense that there are clear risks for many people uh, of speaking out. They may be arrested, they may be interrogated, uh, they may be disappeared, as we see in places like Kenya. The second is the nonprofit industrial complex. We've seen that um, you know, the range of issues that have come up in our conversation today include everything ranging from land, housing, food, uh, to questions of human rights, democracy, uh, et cetera. And it becomes very challenging for people to organize in a way that encompasses this broad set of issues that necessarily must be thought of together, right? When you when it comes time to find ways to sustain the work that you do, and you find that in fact the nonprofit industrial complex specifically wants you to um, isolate, right? And to to think in silos rather than in broad sweeping terms. So those are you know quite significant challenges, but I'm hopeful at the same time. Regress. One must always remain remain hopeful, even if one's not necessarily optimistic about the outcome. And I think it's important to distinguish between those two uh, those two terms. We've got we've had six thousand eight hundred participants here. Uh, it's it's been quite amazing. The the richness of material that both of you have have presented. Uh, somehow the detail. Uh, it's mind blowing the work that you've done to actually help us understand the nature of the US militarization and its collusion with 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 local empire and and Brittany the the you know to the 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 mind shift that you've helped in 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 linking uh uh climate change terrorism security networks desertification and so on. i think these are these are, uh, are really important uh, issues that you both um, 
articulated. What, I, what I'd like to do is just finally uh, is to each of you to say, tell us the title of your book, who is publishing it, and when can we get a copy immediately? <laughs> so, Samar first. This is so embarrassing. One often forgets the full title of one's own book. Um, <laughs> my, the, the title is <laughs> War Making as World Making, Geographies Ooh. of Imperial Warfare in East Africa. And I do not have a date for you. I'm working on it, so stay tuned. And the publisher is? I still, still to be determined. Oh, well, you know, you can always come to us. <laughs> Brittany. Um, so, so similar, so the title of the book is Sustainable Empire, Nature, Knowledge, and Insecurity in the Sahel. I'm in conversation with a couple of different publishers to be determined, um, and I, I really hope for a 2024 publishing date. So, but I will keep you, I'll keep you posted. Please do. I, I think both will be really important, uh, essential books, uh, and I hope that um, the various courses that take place across the continent and uh, in in Europe and the, the US actually get hold of these books to 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 really uh, enable the next generation of young people who are studying Africa to uh, to to really understand the issues that are have come up. Um, as uh, uh, our colleague uh, Jade has pointed out, uh, on the 2nd of August, we have a panel discussion on uh, Fanon yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And we have four uh, um, uh, authors from the book that we published, which is just behind me on that side there, Fanon today. Uh, and um, uh, I hope that you will all uh, attend um, uh, for that. Uh, we're still trying to organize the 9th of August uh, ongoing struggles, but uh, there are so many seminars and, and, and other events taking place. Uh, it's been tough trying to get people to agree to, to participate in, a, in, in our final panel discussion, but we'll work out something. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to express my thanks to, to you, Brittany, for uh, a really, really enlightening uh, presentation and to you, Samar. Uh, thank you both for for giving your time and particularly Samar for getting up so early in the morning uh, to 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 do this. Uh, I hope the temperatures in in France are not too hot uh, for you, but if, if they are, you can always come back to the Sahel. <laughs>